This conference will now be recorded. So thank you so much for being here tonight for our family and plantation record research uh, session. This is part of the monthly, um, typically first Monday of the month, um, and that's actually when we're scheduled now through June. Um, but once a month, uh, genealogy program from the Spartanburg County Public Libraries in Spartanburg, South Carolina. My name is Charity Rouse. I am the Director of Local History and our Kennedy Room of Local and South Carolina History and the Cleveland Genealogical Department. Um, we just usually call ourselves the Kennedy Room because it's easier <laughs> that way. Um, we uh, do genealogy, local history, and archival reference for the library system. And so we are great and, and so happy that you all have joined us tonight. We've got people from all over the country and even the Virgin Islands tonight. So this is awesome. This will be recorded and it will be posted later this week on the library's YouTube page in our genealogy playlist. And um, so if your video is on, it is being recorded and will show up on the screen in addition to mine. It's a quirk of the, the software we're using. So if you prefer not to be uh, on the video, then just turn your video off. Those controls should be, if you're on a computer, at the bottom of the screen. And um, it's the little camera icon and it's either green if it's on or red if it's off. And I have muted everyone um, because we're recording. But we are glad that you're here tonight and or catching us on the replay. And um, we are going to talk about family and plantation research and records. Um, there are a couple of things that we need to just address right off the top. Um, this is for anyone associated with the property, with the plantation, and whether you are a descendant of an owner or enslaved person or descendant of some other of, of an employee of a, a plantation. Um, these records are not something that has been gathered together and um, you know put in one place. Even within a family, things are scattered. Um, sometimes things did not survive the dumpster when the house was sold or you know house fires happened various things but there are an awful lot of records that you can find if you just keep digging once you find the records you will have to do considerable work within the records to reconstruct the families because these are not records typically that were done for genealogical purposes these are records uh, talking about the work of the estate, the work of the farm, the work of the plantation. Um, so there's no one place to look. Um, I use the term plantation. That is the most typical name for a Southern large property that had enslaved labor. Um, not all plantations were large. Um, in fact, uh, kind of the average number of enslaved a household owned was in the 10 to 12 range from what I've been able to find in my research. If somebody else knows something different, please feel free to share. Um, but it's one of those situations where there are going to be um, plantations and farms that have hundreds of enslaved. There are plantations, farms, families that have maybe one or two enslaved. And so some of these records, most of these records are going to be findable, hopefully for the variety of sizes that are available. Um, this research, um, and I say maybe in the slide, um, I think I need to upgrade that to is emotionally difficult for many people, most people. Um, and one thing as we get into this, we do have to set ourselves at a historical remove, as difficult as that can be, and remember that we cannot change what our ancestors did 
We can't change them, their society, their behavior, or their relationships. It is our responsibility to grapple with how to acknowledge the real and lasting legacy of the people for whom the records were created on the owner side and on the enslaved side. So this is one of those things where we look at these same documents for many different reasons, and we really have to just acknowledge this, the plantation system was what it was. We're dealing with after effects of it today, but we have to move forward in reconstructing the family units. And another note, you may or may not have biological connections to everyone in these records, but they are records of a community, the community of that particular place in that particular time with enslaved, with employees, with owners. Um, you may find that DNA plus testing plus paper trail research may confirm connections and it may not confirm connections. Um, there have been enough generations for many families in the last 150 years that some of those biological connections are pretty hard to trace. So know that it's a possibility, it's not always findable but doesn't mean you can't ask the question. Um, Kristen has heard me say, it never hurts to ask the question many, many times. So, some types of records to look for, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, some of the major types of records that you're going to be able to find. You want to look for the plantation records and ledgers, the books, account books, basically. Uh, wills will often name um, enslaved because they were unfortunately property. Uh, probate, um, along with the wills. Equity or chancery cases. Um, equity is what we called that court in South Carolina. Chancery is what Virginia called that court. You may find in other places that it's handled by a different court. So, um, do take a look um, in the area that you are researching to find out what the court that, um, if there were questions or concerns about probate and about a will, what court handled that. Um, you know, if if the primary inheritor, the, the son, was three and, you know, the daughters were older, there might be a case because they would want to get their inheritance a little bit earlier than that three-year-old turning 21. So you may find um, the equity and chancery cases, and we'll, we'll see some examples from uh, one case in particular. You may want to look in deeds, um, and these are usually not indexed, but they are often in the deed books when um, an enslaved person was sold, from person to person, that deed of transfer um, often did get filed. So um, take a look at that. Unfortunately, many of our clerks of court through the years chose to not index those. Um, one of the things that I've been looking into a little bit recently, um, happened to catch a, a interview with an author on C-SPAN 3, the other, uh, a month or two ago now. Um, uh, Stephanie Jones Rogers, and she was talking about um, her book, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. Um, I had not gotten very far into the book. Um, as I said, some, some of this is really emotional reading and can be. Um, but one of the the big takeaways i've gotten so far from the interview and from what i've read is that dower or gifts of enslaved were often given to daughters and wives um and the sons got the land and the daughters got the enslaved and so in a lot of estates and so you're gonna want to look in household inventories of the daughter as she marries and moves to see if you can trace a little bit more of that. 
Um, you may find family websites that have blog posts or other entries relating to this interconnected um, relationship. There, um, there have been a number of PBS specials um, about various families that you may find um, those films talking about the place research of the plantation. You do want to check for research done by other genealogists and publications such as the National Genealogical Society Quarterly um, because they will have done a lot of the heavy lifting for you um, and it's a vetted uh, peer-reviewed um, publication. So you may find by chance the family you're looking for. You're also going to want to look for newspaper advertisements or notices of property sales, um, those types of things um, where enslaved are going to be mentioned. And last but not least, you will be looking for diaries and family letters because those um, often tell the day to day life of the place where they are. So where to search? Now that we know some of these records that we're planning to look for, how do you locate these records? Well, these records are available in a bunch of places and um, you're gonna have to just kind of start looking for various things. So, um, archives. Archives is where, are where a lot of family paper collections end up. And so you're going to want to start with the catalogs of the state and local archives, where the property is, um, where the family may have lived, where the descendants may have moved to. Um, you may have to do some, some old school research on this because a lot of the smaller private archives may not be online yet. Um, yes, I know it's 2021, but a lot of these archives are very much still in the pen and paper inventorying, maybe typing an Excel spreadsheet, but not highly online because that costs money and you have to have technical skills. So you may have to email, write an actual letter and send it through snail mail or call to find out um, what is in their catalog. Um, and again, it never hurts to ask the question, be polite, don't demand, and um, the, the archivist will most likely um, be nice back and let you know, hey, well, we have this or we don't have that, or we have this part of the family who lived here, but not anyone who lived in South Carolina. So, you know, ask the question. Um, Archive Grid. Archive Grid is a fabulous newer um, cataloging, um, joint cataloging project from many archives. Um, you may be familiar with WorldCat, which is a library, worldwide library catalog for a lot of libraries. Not everybody participates because, again, it takes money to participate and you have to find it worth paying to be in that um, catalog. Um, but Archive Grid is the archival version of that. Um, also run through uh, the OCLC services. Um, you want to check your local historical society, the local historical commission, the archive, um, like Marion County, South Carolina has an archive. Um, that's one of the old school ones. You got to call on a day that the archivist is there and it's limited. Um, or, you know, library. Um, look at both public and academic libraries, because academic libraries, if someone is a graduate of that um, particular university, their um, papers may very well have gone to that university where they are an alum, or their child is an alum and, you know, the, the papers arrived there. Um, Timing was off on this, but we ended up with a donation coming in last Thursday from a long time family who owned a property here in Spartanburg County. And the um, contents of that go back into the 1700s, um, if not earlier, and um, talk about the property and their ledgers and there was a store on the property and there's all sorts of wonderful stuff in this family collection. Um, and so uh, 
if you have Williams's from the Williams um, property down near Pauline um, in that area, uh, they were neighbors of a couple of the Woffords. Um, keep it in and you're out. Um, let us know you're interested. Once we get that processed, um, we'll let you know. But these types of collections come in every day um, as people are cleaning out attics. You do want to research the descendants of the family who owned the property at the time you are interested in because those items may not have stayed with the house. They may have gone with whatever kid was interested and saved it from the dumpster. Um, so, and you're looking for family papers, diaries, photographs, etc. You also may want to ask the current property owner because I don't know about you, but I've moved into houses that aren't that old, but you find those boxes left in the attic. So you're going to also want to research the, the owners of the property current all the way back and potentially even before your um, family owned that property. So, or you know, the target family owned that property. So there are a lot of places that you might find these papers. And these are just the personal papers, not the um, papers such as the probate and the wills and those types of things, because those are more likely going to be in a court's hands or a state archive's hands or a county archive. So I mentioned archive grid. This is what it looks like. Um, and the this happens to be just a collection that I pulled up um, having to do with part of the McKeever family of Darlington County, South Carolina. And it is a set of um, papers that they have listed that are from the Law family, um, or that was the donor, but there are Law, McKeever, and Wilcox families. They say, okay, it's in the University of South Carolina archive. So you can click that and get contact information. I can't click it right now because this is just a screenshot, but you could. It gives you the details. This is one carton. It's 1.25 linear feet. So 15 inches, you know? And so that's a fair number of papers. You see topics listed over here. And so Baptists are listed, commerce, Methodists, missionaries, Presbyterians, and soldiers. This, fa um, this particular family, um, the McGeever family is my connection through to this, um, were very staunch Baptists and some of the, the children married into staunch Methodist and Presbyterian families. So kind of interesting. And you'll see a description here in the details about it's correspondence, business records, genealogical note, historical essays, memoirs, records of mercantile operations in Alabama and in Darlington, South Carolina. Um, and so if you read the details, and one of the things about ArchiveGrid is you don't actually have to go to ArchiveGrid to search this, although you can, um, but this will show up in your average Google search. And if you see an archive grid, I would check that out. Um, and then you get uh, correspondence, history, personal correspondence, and the page goes on. And then it will tell you also on the bottom right um, part, it will list the family names that are um, represented in the collection. I think what I Googled was McGeever family papers maybe, and, and this was one of the results. Um, South Carolina Department of Archives and History is another great place to take a look. In their um, research and genealogy section, they've got all sorts of online research options. If you have not explored those lately, I would highly recommend that you do. Um, they do have a fair number of things online um, and visible. The SCARA is South Carolina Electronic Records something. I can't remember what the A is, but that's where like the 1915 birth certificates are and other things that they're just going straight to digital, not putting on microfilm. 
um, the South Carolina Historic Preservation Resources, I, again, I can't remember what the R is, the South Carolina Archival Catalog, so that would be a good thing to check as well. And then they've got guides to collections and things. Um, I went into their record and image search that top one, this online records index, and I did a search for McEver. Now I had to scroll down. Um, they are, uh, there are a lot of different records that the McEvers were involved in because they were a very prominent family. Um, and this happens to be a will of William DeWitt, Darlington District. It's a manuscript. But the reason I picked this to show is because in the record, they note Caesar, slave, Kate, slave, Chapman, Alan Chapman is a freed person's presumably white name, Eleanor Chapman, Charles, slave, DeWitt, Charles DeWitt, Dorothy DeWitt, Harriet DeWitt, etc. Um, and you get down here and it's in Evander um, McEver. And um, so this can help you. They list all of the people mentioned in the document. And that can be vital as you are researching, as you are trying to put together a full picture of that property. Um, so take a look. Um, if you have a first name, you may want to search that first name of that enslaved person in the South Carolina um, record and image search. I didn't try to search by slave with the parentheses, so maybe that was why I wasn't getting all of the slave records. Um, but they are at least working through their documents and making sure that they are listing both the enslaved and everyone else in the document. So kudos to the South Carolina Department of Archives and History for that. Um, another place that I got major help on this and, and actually started the whole process of the research that I've been doing on this, um, Darlington County Historical Commission and Museum has a wonderful new website. Um, they are working on opening a fabulous museum. They are in the old jail in Darlington County, and it's a fun little cramped place to research, and they will be turning the old jail building into their climate-controlled archival storage and building um, new research space in the new building. Um, they've gotten a donation and grants and things to work on this. Um, it's gonna be fabulous. But in the meantime, if you have questions, email them. Brian and his team are wonderful. They do have an African-American heritage part of their website. Um, so you may want to take a look at that um, if you have Darlington County connections. Um, I had been physically at the Darlington County Historical Commission a number of years ago when I was down in that part of the state researching my Rouses. My earliest known Rouse is this R.A. Rouse, or one of these R.A. Rouses. I can't prove that they are all the same person. Working on it. Third great-grandfather. And active in Baptist churches, apparently deputy sheriff in 1868. Kind of cool. And then this was the citation that I wrote it down. I copied this page somewhere. Um, the first uh, administrator of the Darlington Historical Commission took a lot of time to handwrite notations of when they came across a name in a record, whether that person was a witness or a whatever or a whatever in the record. And so this one says, R.A. Rouse, overseer in Marlboro, Dr. J. K. McEver, 1847, Equity 308. I had been thinking it was a probate case. There's pro he, he, this probably appears in probate as well, but it was in the equity role, 308. 
And I had looked at this on one of the old hand crank microfilm machines back years ago at the, the archives and couldn't get good pictures on it and couldn't wait for two hours for the people who were on the good machines to leave. So I didn't have the actual records of this, but I had looked at it. And um, you also see the next entry that R.A. Rouse Shoemaker, Darlington District. Um, so you know, he was he was he was also a postmaster later. Um, so Family Search now has the Darlington County equity records for this period and so a lot of other deeds and probate and wills and things. They are not name indexed on the Family Search site. Do not try to search from the name on the front page. Go to a catalog search, look for the area, and then pretend you're looking at microfilm, but you can do it at home at 2 a.m. if you would like, when you can't sleep. But case number 308 is identified at the beginning with this Somebody kept writing 308 on it, so we know it's case 308. And it lists um, some people's names, uh, McIntosh, executor of J.K. McKeever, uh, versus Rachel Furman, uh, Richard Furman, and wife et al. So in equity court, somebody has to bring a case against somebody else. So you will see one set of heirs bringing a case against another set of heirs. It does not mean they're fighting. It means they wanted to get this in front of a judge. And to do that, there had to be two sides to whatever it is. Now, don't get me wrong, it could mean that they were definitely fighting. Um, there's also in this equity case, um, this copy of the will. So this is not the original, this is a clerk's copy of the will. It's gorgeous handwriting. This one, unfortunately, doesn't actually name any of the enslaved, um, but it's there. Um, this is the will that is actually in the will book. It's not in the equity records. I've got the wrong header, um, but this is the, the will starts here and comes in. So know that you may find multiple copies of the same records if um, there was a dispute or anything like that because you know they had to provide a copy of the will and so some of them may be better copies than others some handwriting is going to be better so sometimes you can find a better version of the will that's more readable um, now this paper tells a quite the story of why these records, why this equity case is important. So it's the estate of John uh, K. McKeever, an account current with James McIntosh, uh, who's the administrator of the estate. Um, I'm going to pull up two sections of this account book, account register for the uh, estate. The top is right up here on the left, this first couple of things. 1846, November 20th, to cash paid Alex McIntosh for Negro woman Zilphia and her child per bill. So, and $600. So, the Negro woman Zilphia and her child were purchased by the estate from Alex McIntosh. So if you are descended from Zulfia, that is great information for you to know because you know that Zulfia came from Alex McIntosh. Um, and then you have, I mean, and this is just what you see here to cash to ordinary of Marlboro for warrant of appraisement. So that's part of the estate settlement. Um, Miss Douglas for sewing for the family, $1.30. So you know, it was 50 cents for the, the ordinary for the warrant of appraisement. And it keeps going on. Uh, Mrs. King did sewing for looks like $2.25. Um, the reason I was so interested in this 
particular thing is this box in the green that was from down in this lower left portion of the left hand page. To cash paid Ellen and Custis his wages as overseer for 1846 on the Darlington Plantation, 150 bucks. To cash Robert A. Rouse his wages as overseer for 1846 on the Marlboro Plantation for $300 and his account for two. Um, he may have continued to be a shoemaker throughout time and it, it just wasn't his primary occupation after sometime after the 1840 census. Um, and the real question is, there is an Anne Ellen Hustis who is the, I am told, stepfather of Robert Rouse. Um, he's buried, Robert Rouse is buried in the Hustis Carter Cemetery. And there are Carters also involved in some of these things um, as overseers. So this is my connection to the McKeever family. I'm not related to them but my ancestor worked for them. So um, this is another page of um, document that you just see the, the various accounts. Um, one of the um, great resources that has developed in the last handful of years is the Digital Library on American Slavery. This project has developed out of student work and professors working at the uh, UNC Greensboro, um, University of North Carolina Greensboro. And so this is in the Digital Library on American Slavery. And I searched the petitions for the McEvers. And this abstract of the information, it doesn't actually, I don't, I'm not sure that it actually takes you to the document at all. It tells you later on where the document is. In 1856, it's saying two of the daughters of the late John K. McKeever and their husbands joined McKeever's three execu uh, ex executors in seeking a partition of the testator's estate. This is um, the case that they're trying to, to get this settled. They state the late McEver died in 1846, possessed of a house and lot located in the village of Society Hill, five other plantations comprised of more than 3,000 acres, and 120 slaves, whose number has grown to 150. In his will, he made um, detailed provisions regarding the education of his younger children and where they should live, other bequests, um, who's looking after the children, his sister, the pastor of his church, various things. Um, the younger John McKeever is now 21 years old, and his sister um, is married, the wife of Samuel Presley. Um, she's still younger than he is, but he is, but she's now married. And so they're asking for that estate to be settled. So remember, this is 1856. He died in 1846. And so sometimes you have a lag in getting things um settled because of um somebody had to turn 21 um and that uh the actual probate file is long um you will notice here that there are people associated they have 160 names of slaves they have no free persons of colors they have six defendants seven petitioners because um there were seven on one side six on the other because of spouses and administrators and such and then three other people that are listed and so when you if you scroll down the page it refers you to the case at um the south carolina department of archives and history so um when i searched a different search in that digital library on American slavery. It took me to the UNC Greensboro Digital Collections, and it gave me two results for the McKeevers. Um, the bottom result here is Southern Education Board con uh, Correspondence of 1902. So Charles Duncan McKeever was involved in that, and so it's in his papers collection. And so, if you're interested in education, that would be something to check out. 
the other thing that showed up is something that I wanted to blow up and let you see. I'm not sure why it came up when I searched for McKeever. Um, it is Darlington, South Carolina, so it may have done a location search as well. But this is an ad for a runaway slave. Um, for $20 reward, a, uh, one of an enslaved ran away from C.I. Oates Hotel in Wilmington, 22nd of July, 1856. He is a light-complected mulatto man named Jack, sometimes called Zach. Said boy is about five feet four or five inches high, rather broad between the eyes, and has a lively quick look out of the eyes, wears a large whisker on his chin, which he will no doubt shave off. I'm, I'm assuming that means a, bowl, a beard. Um, and more of his description, he's about 36 or 37 and weighs 135 or 140 pounds, has a scar near one of his eyes in the edge of the hair. And there will be $20 given um, if he is confined so that um, John Muse can come get him. So um, you can put, if someone disappears from the plantation records, you can look in newspapers and see if you can put pieces together with a runaway, um, which is a good, good thing to do. And newspaper sites are, are varied, um, and you can look at many of them. Um, a really good place to start this research um, is Google, your favorite or your favorite search engine. I tend to use Google. Um, you may find um, LibGuides, academic libraries produce LibGuides to assist students in their research. Um, there are many, many, many on the topic of plantations and slavery, um, and they are telling their students where to find first person resources, they're telling their students where good histories are about that topic. Um, so uh, if you see a LibGuide, know it's an academic librarian who is trying to help people who research out with a, a topic. You're going to want to try a couple different searches, the name the family, papers of name, plantation records for location. Um, they may not always be called the name of the plantation. Um, so it just depends. Um, when I was looking for the McEvers and looking for where would I find resources for this, um, there is a website called familyfoundgenealogy.com. That is someone who is related in, in, um, to the Bostics who um, are descendants of some of the enslaved from the McKeever um, property. And um, I haven't been able to determine who the my genealogical is. They don't say who they are, um, at least in a place I can find. Uh, blog sites are not always that user friendly for the people, not the poster. Um, SouthCarolinaPlantations.com um, lists is trying to put together a list of all of the various plantations. Again, you have the what is considered a plantation debate. Um, and so it's just one of those situations that, you know, you might find a reference to or a history of the building, references to some of the families who lived there. So you start having names to research. Um, John F. Baker Jr. did a great book, wrote a great book called The Washingtons of Wessington Plantation, Stories of My Family's Journey to Freedom. Um, I was able to hear him talk about his research and his experience writing this book um, at a conference, online conference that I was attending this summer. It, and that is, um, the Wessington Plantation is one of, I think, the only uh, plantation in Tennessee where complete records have survived. So they have the records of the um, enslaved births. They have family groupings and things. He also descends from multiple lines on that um, plantation and um, worked cooperatively with the descendants of the white owning family 
and so it's a wonderful picture of life on the estate um on the on the plantation and the website is linked on your um uh uh, handout. Um, I referenced Stephanie Jones Rogers earlier. They were her property, white women as slave owners in the American South. I forgot a word. Sorry about that. And then I discovered, and I had heard Scott talk at a conference a couple years ago, so I knew his work was out there. But there is a, a how many page? 58 page document something like that 55 page document called three generations a narrative lineage one line of descendants of boston and family progenitors of the bostics and african-american family from west africa and it is taking these various McGeever family records, including estate listings, um, in property inventories from multiple of the daughters after they had married, and tracing this Bostic family through these various records. Um, it is fabulous work. He submitted this particular paper as a part of his um, board of certification for genealogists um, application or recertification. And so it is really excellent. That is one of the reasons why I say do check to see if someone has researched this and published something. Also network, 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 because you will find as you talk to people more resources. Um, the In the chat, I do see the, the um, Federal Writers Project, they interviewed um, folks in the 1930s, late 1930s to 1940. Um, who had been born in slavery and um, had been freed at emancipation and they were old, older at that point in their lives because, you know, if you were born before 1865. Um, and so those records are great. And then also um, Friedman's Bureau records are slightly out of the purview of this, but they're a transitional bridge to get the next. Um, and um there's there's so much material and i do apologize i had some other examples that i had saved and they went poof into the wilds of the internet um between the computer at work and the computer here so but if you have questions you know look at look at the local history rooms look at the various places but you know if you write us an email and say, I want to know everything about the so-and-so family. It's not very helpful. Target your research, look at some, some specific places at a time, um, and um, have fun with this. Um, I'm going to stop recording and then we'll take questions. <laughs>